Hey everyone, welcome to Chess on the Brain with David Bennett. So we have a game today by Andreas of Switzerland, and he submitted a game against uh, Felix. Looks like they're, I think, around the 12, 1300 range. He said he's been playing for the past few years at a local club, and this is a really fascinating game. So I want to delve into that, and feel free to, you know, I'm doing this live, so mention any comments you have, any uh, any suggestions that, that maybe he could have done or his opponent could have done or any questions you have, or just let me know afterwards and we'll uh, have a discussion about the game. So this, this is really interesting. A lot of really important concepts to pull from this game and it got it got really tactical. Let's jump into it. So he was playing black, his opponent did E4. Andreas does C6. I like this opening, the Karo Khan opening. It's deceptively passive. It seems like C6 is such a passive move. But, in fact, it's actually really strong and there are a lot of really aggressive lines in the Karo Khan. I mean, for example, if you want to play it like Karpov and, and be very uh, solid and play like, you know, the Knight, knight at Knight BD7 line and Knight at 6 line, you can do something like that. Um, or you can play like the Bronze Team Larson attack, depending on what your, what White does. But Black can definitely get very aggressive in the Karo Khan. Um, but its staple is the solidity of the Karo Khan, and I can't argue with that. Um, but it's very similar to whether you're going to do the French with e6 or c6. The point is, you're getting d5. Same with the Scandinavian. Some people say the Scandinavian is like an improved Karo Khan in certain lines because you don't have to get c6 in. But I do think there are some benefits because you're, you're holding the center, as you see he does here. When he plays c6 and d5, if white ever takes, you take back, you hold that center. So, knight c3. Now, knight c3 is not the standard. Obviously, d4 is the standard move. Take the whole center. Knight c3 is seeding it to some extent. And uh, d4, sorry, d5. White takes it. Honestly, not so ambitious. I don't think this is very ambitious of uh, Felix to play here. Um, I guess he could play d4 immediately, but he goes for queen f3. Um, well, that's, I'd say this is um, premature. Because you can see, uh, I mean, we're not going to take too much, uh, you know, put too much credibility in Stockfish's analysis um, at the in the opening at least, because computers don't know the openings that well. You know, we'll, we'll put some faith in them when it comes to pure tactics and end games. Maybe and to some extent they're getting better position, but you know, it says for what it's worth, it says minus 0.4, so black is up like half a pawn in value. By the way, I'm playing some Swiss uh, folk music, so I want to try to get you know whatever whatever country you're from. If you send me your game, I want to try and get some background music from your country. I just pulled this from YouTube. Or, you know, if you have, if you have a particular genre, I like to make it eclectic, pull from everything. And hey, it's I, I found that it, it, it's pretty fun to have that background music in it. Just, and, and I've been getting a lot into that connection between chess and music. So let, let, let's let our, all the, our, you know, our brains fire, um, our neurons fire in all different ways and find these connections. Um, Dr. Knight F6. Seems logical. You're just defending the pawn. Bishop to b5 check. As I say, don't check just to check. You know, have, check with the per. They say always check. It might be mate. Sure, if you have a mate, go for it. But if it's not, and if it doesn't achieve anything, well, it may not help you. Uh, in this case, I don't really know where else the bishop should go because it's sort of awkward on f3, honestly, to have the queen there. So you need to see coordination. You need to see harmony. And uh, well, maybe the knight can come to e2. And you don't want to block the bishop, I get that. So he's trying to get the bishop out. And then knight c6, that seems totally good. h3. Passive, honestly. I think it's a little passive of white to do that. Trying to stop bishop g4, I guess. But come on, it's it's the opening. You have to be assertive. You know, you have to be fighting for, especially well, from both sides. But if you're hoping to get any advantage with white by having the first move, you have to strike. You have to place pressure on your opponent, or if you're playing hypermodern chess, to, you know, let them build up, but be at least prepared to strike, <laughs> right? But h3, I'm not sure. Well, you're preparing to strike. Oh, maybe it's g4, g5. Maybe that's the intent. Um, it's not It's not convincing. Me. And it doesn't convince Stockfish either. Minus 1.2, meaning it already thinks that black is, um, or, or algorithm, whatever, it, it, it tells that, that black is up um, over a pawn. So, and what it recommends is d4. So e6 is modest. Now here's where you can really take the initiative. I, I actually like the line it recommends with d4. So if you go d4, and I think I yeah I tested out a line. I said okay, but what if what if white goes knight e4? 
Um, and this seems pretty good. Let's just un unpin the knight. And anytime you have to worry about the knight coming to e5, again, hitting that misplaced queen, trying to really make that queen uncomfortable and, and refute it. You want to punish our opponent. Have to punish your opponent when they do dubious things. Have to have that mindset of, hey, you're not going to get away with that with me. You know? um, okay, so after G takes F6, it's a certain confidence and an understanding of the game where you don't let them get away with that. Um, of course, you do it, you know, based on your pure, you know, hard analysis. Try to punish them. So after G takes F6. Uh, now this looks like okay, you're doubling your pawns. It's a very ambitious approach, but but again, it's it's in that in the vein of seeking uh, activity, seeking initiative immediately. And and now we're getting into that sort of like I mentioned the Lars the Bronstein Larson variation where you where you do this actually and it's slightly different. Um, but usually in, the, in that line, D4 and E4 are played. But you can see again that that, that type of Karo Khan that's more aggressive. So up to 92, um, pick the bishop, get your rook out. It, you know, put some pressure on G2, it's in a half open file, right? It's an open file, there's no pawns. There's only, if your pawn moved away, it's a half open file, if there's a still there. Now, knight, say knight blocks, for instance, hit the bishop back, hit the queen, get your bishop really nicely placed on the diagonal, hit the pawn, maybe provoke F3, which would be awful. That would soften up the G3 point. I mean, everything is just loose. And as you see, we're developing with tempo. We're, we're improving the position with the gain of time. That's what we want. After castles, d3. And, and so, for instance, you, you know, something along these lines. But you can just see that black is going to achieve this massive position out of the opening. And uh, I would not want to be playing white here. Now, now, notice that the pawn is not only serving as a thorn in white's right in the gut, really. And they say usually a thorn in the side. This is a thorn in the gut. Um, but it also serves to uh, restrict the bishop. This bishop is already stopping the pawn from moving. No Fionchetto's in sight. No normal development in sight of the bishop. So this is awful. And uh, if you take, well, then you just allow the knight to infiltrate with, again, tempo, hitting the queen. Beautiful. So this is a nice line. Of course, it's not going to happen exactly like that. This is a pure line. But just to, just to sample things and, and just show you that after d4, uh, rather than the more um, modest, more, more passive e6, um, by going for the gusto with d4, you can certainly achieve something. And it's, it, it should be your default, right? Your default, I think, if you're fighting for the advantage out of the opening, should be aggression. And again, this is not, I'm not going to focus too much on the opening because this is not on Grace's weakness. Instead, his weakness tends to happen in the middle game. That, you know, he does well in the opening, as you can see down here. Um, the opening was in Black's favor, right? It's going towards Black's advantage. Middle game was actually early middle game is good, and then it shifted suddenly in the middle game, and we enter a losing end game. So I'm going to focus more there. But anyone else who's watching, maybe you could benefit from that, and we can all benefit from you know from fighting for the initiative. So, but e6 is fine. It's modest, but it's developing, okay? d3, and again, a little too modest, h6. Um, so, so similar how white did h6, black did, a, did a, white is h3, black is h6 and stops the bishop, I guess. Um, but maybe it's a little too accommodating, right? We have to be uncompromising, relentless. Um, but this is, uh, this seems fine. Bishop d6 just seems fine. Bishop g5, you can, I just looked at the see, okay, what's going to happen? Well, these bishops are both going to get driven back. Now, notice this idea. See, it, it looks like it's annoying, but if we, if we think about, well, how can we kick the bishop back? We have this idea once we castle. So if we can, unless he takes. Well, if he takes, then we get the bishop pair, and we can always unpin it like that if we need. But it's kind of provocative to say, hey, go ahead and take my knight on c6 if you want, or even f6. Um, look on f6, yeah, we can just trade into an endgame. And again, we're going to have a nice center and the bishop pair. The double pawn is nominal, you know. It's a double pawn, but don't don't um, don't overreact to such a such a small uh, structural disadvantage or structural weakening, because actually that double pawn can give you more influence in the center. It will, and, and it will open up the G file as I mentioned. So there's aspects to it that are good, and we would get the bishop here, which is also good. But you're gaining these uh, you know positive these imbalances that work for you. Now, so for instance, for instance, the knight comes out, and then we hit the queen. Queen moves, and then you do this. And there's a very typical setup the route to deal with the bishop. Two knights on the G and F file, and then we go for H6. Who cares if he takes on H6? 
I welcome that, right? Again, you have to have this sort of contrary and attitude where, oh, you you know, you can't be afraid of what your opponent's going to do. You have instead you have to say, please bring it on, right? This sort of combat, it's a combative, contrary and attitude that's necessary for success, I think, um, in chess at least. Maybe in other things too. Um, but hey, I, I'm all about being communitarian, working with the community, working with people. We don't want to all eat each, you know, we don't want to all eat each other's heads off. But at least, but at least in chess, we do have to. We're competing, right? When we know we're competing, we have to be aggressive about it. So we just say, hey, I don't care about what you're going to do. I'm going to be relentless. I'm going to kick your bishops back. And then I'm going to kick your um, this guy away. And if you want to take, that's great. Again, I'm gaining imbalances that might favor me. Gaining this awesome bishop in the center, which is, as I, I like to talk about this all the time, uncontested bishops. If you have an uncontested bishop, for instance, uh, on the dark squares, it's not challenged by another bishop. That's a huge asset. Because if you ever get this battery going, proves his queen. If you ever get that battery going, that's going to be checkmate or very close to it, and force some concessions along the way. Not to mention the the asset of the two bishops. It's just a long-term asset that you can use and uh, could benefit you. So after, <clears throat> or you can trade off that asset for another asset. Um, so after h6, a3, uh, and the computers that just keep on developing, of course, that doesn't a3 is dubious, doesn't do anything. So again, we should be in a punishing mindset. Now bishop d6 works here. Bishop out. Castles, I think that's fine. Sure, you could have gone e5 right away. Actually, no, this is another way, again, seeking that initiative. So, yeah, you played fine in the opening, but I would advise to, that you play, um, you know, as aggressively as possible in the opening, especially when your opponent makes errors. Try to really pounce on that. Uh, after knight takes d5, it's a blunder. Why is it a blunder? Try and see why. Because you have that typical discovered, it's kind of like happened happen with the French a lot, where, for instance, the d4 pawn is not really hanging, because that, uh, or in this case, the d5 pawn is not really hanging. But the discovered check after you trade and you hit the queen, you pick up the queen for the bishop. So uh, after e5, then, um, probably d4 would be played to block the pawn, because you're actually threatening fork of these guys. So you have to go here. Oops, not there. <laughs> you can't do that. Go here, and then you just bypass, gaining space. But now black is playing as if black has the white pieces and is pressing in the French defense with tempo. Again, punishing the queen, making it go back, and castling, and black is just fine. Uh, doing really well. Okay, natural control, more space, more development, and so forth. Back castle king. Okay, so after bishop takes, well, voluntarily, I don't see why. Probably because they didn't like the idea of 95. Um, but now you've Handed black, that uncontested, uh, well now it's the, the light squared bishop. You have the bishop there. You can see the bishop might come here and there's some influence here. Or b7 and you play c5 and start to rip open that long diagonal. You know, if we push those two pawns down, and we really see some action on, against the queen and against the g2 pawn and so forth. So don't don't underestimate those fianchettos because that's the longest diagonal. That's why they're attractive. Because the, you seek the, the road, that's the longest road for them to use. Uh, not a4, it doesn't do anything. You just check him and he has to go back. Um, you could have gone e5 right away as well, but I think this was good. Yeah, queen e5 check is a good choice. Knight goes back. Now e5. Perfect. And again, you're threatening uh, here. But of course, the bishop goes d2 and makes the queen a little intimidated. Um, and then the queen goes all the way back to c7. Maybe you could have gone somewhere else. Maybe, uh, maybe a6 was possible, but that's fine. Okay, knight there. Makes sense. Get on the half open file, attack the pawn, force a response. Put the question essentially to the pawn and say, what are you going to do, right? So b3 was the choice. <laughs> it turns out maybe Peter thinks should on here. Look at that, minus two. So already it's it, it looks like Black's position, it's, it's better, but it's it, but the computer thinks it's already winning this century, as if, as if Black is up two pawns, almost up a piece, which would be three points. Um, so why is b3 so bad? Uh, well, it allows it allows black to just really start pressing in the center. Um, but why would b4 prevent that? I mean, either way, d4 is coming. And you say, oh, well, what's so bad about d4? So he did rook here, preparing maybe e4, which is also good. And it still says what well, black is better, but it goes the evaluation goes from about you know for what it's worth, uh, based on what the computer says, two versus one point four. It with perfect com perfect computer play, so we have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, but 
this would have been interesting. If you had done, um, if you had done uh, D4 right here. So at first I was looking at this, I'm like, well, you just let the knight come in the center, right? But you're, you're doing so again with initiatives. So the knight with tempo. The knight has to move, you gain another tempo. But if he, if he goes here, then you can just start pushing. But I was thinking, well, what if he goes knight e4? And you just take it. You think, oh, well, you're just trading off pieces. But here's the key, f5. Because you again, you're going to be bearing down on the f-file against the queen, against the f-pawn, pairing open the center to maybe get e4 eventually. So if d takes f5, now actually in this case, if they took it, of course, you're just going to gain more time. Take back with the bishop, threaten this, have that x-ray on the queen. I mean, it's just terrible. Um, you could do immediately. I assume if they took, you could just be okay with rook takes as well. Um, but I would like to develop my bishop. Hit the pawn, and, and the queen is queen is in no man's land. The queen is just stuck out there in a wasteland in white's position. It's awful. So this is basically, a, for all intents and purposes, a one game. I mean, you're hitting c2, you're hitting the queen, you have the bishop pair on an opening, opening up the board, this is coming, and so forth. It's terrible. Um, so... Instead, well, or, or for example, and if the knight went to a4, just to show you how bad that is, after c5, queen goes to g3, knight centralizes. You want to take h6 with this little trick on the pin, it doesn't even work. It just I was just curious about this computer line. I mean, this is a computer line, but you go here, you guard in here, but it just shows you how bad it is, because now you're trying to drive the queen off, and this bishop's going to be hanging. So you come in, okay, you hit the queen again. You check, you just move the king. Bishop moves, and then, and then the queen actually gets stuck in there, so that was just kind of funny. Even though you can, you can hang this, but actually, if, if they took, I think the queen is immediately lost. It's amazing. <laughs> and then black wins. You have to give up the queen for the bishop. So it just shows you how bad things can get very quickly here. Um, but those are very tactical lines. But still, that d4 is the move you should really be considering right away. But I get it. You want to go for this. I think it's also completely fine. So rookie 8, this is fine. It's still much better for you. And then bishop takes h6. Now this is really interesting because now at first I didn't see the option. I'm like, oh, you know, when I saw it, I was like, well, this looks bad. The bishop's taking you if you want to take back. Queen, oops, the queen's going to take the knight, overloading this pawn effectively. But you, Andreas plays very, very nicely here. So I commend you for that, Andreas, that you found this move to ignore the bishop and simply go e4. Now, of course, you're stopping queen g3. There's no queen g4 in sight. There's no tricks like queen g3 and mate. Um, on, G, on the focal point G7 as the target that, that Vukovic talks about in Art of Attack and Chess. So no, you're not going to get that. You're simply going E4, but look at this. This is awesome. When he takes, again, most precise move. And now black is winning. So yeah, you can see, I think on, Andreas is very strong in tactics. You have an understanding. Art of Attack and Chess will tell you about that, about how to rip open the position when you have a centralized king you're facing. Um, very nicely done. Now we have to execute. We're beginning the process of exploiting him for his dubious play, for his poor play. Um, but here is the key. Here's where there's a couple chances here where, where Andreas could have kind of just knocked him out. Um, but still getting a good position. But these again, these so again, like we see over and over again these chances where you have to really get that decisive strike when you have the chance. Um, but this is good. You're down at what I think it's a pawn down theoretically, right? Two, four, five against three, six. But that pawn is irrelevant. Look at the, the E files open, bearing down on the king, X-raying through the knight. This is under pressure. This is under pressure. So here's the mistake. The we want the, this. This should be. This is not even about moves. Forget about moves. It's about the fundamental target. Keep a target in mind. Where what is Black's target in this position, other than the king, obviously? But we think about focal points and awkward pieces. Which piece would you like to win? Obviously, you have this pin on the e file, so we want to win the knight. Now, if we take the bishop, sure, we get that uncontested bishop. We get those two bishops on the opening, opening up the board with, two, with the two bishops is favorable. But if you take that knight, you're actually removing the defender of this one, and we have that deadly move. What's think about this? For example, if queen takes c3, oh, if queen takes, you have bishop e5. That's just over, and then you got a skewer through here and you I don't think you want to play knight d4 I don't think you want to block that oops this now you have a ch discovered check and we're picking up the queen you want to block okay you're still going to take the queen that's terrible right so if queen moves you pick up the rook that's losing um and now if the knight can't the knight can't take if you want to take with the bishop now here's the, the cool thing you can do is that again you have that 
in. So what do we do? The computer already shows you the arrow, but after bishop a6, you're really going to bear down, and there's absolutely no way to block that. So you're just winning the piece, at least. You're winning a piece with, with an attack. So I don't even... I mean, and then if... Oh, if castles, I think we could probably just go bishop takes. We fork these two. Well, you know, the queen could get away by creating maybe a threat on here. Does that even work? Probably not. No, you can't, because you can't go here. Yeah, you know, this this is covered. Look at this crisscrossing. There's bishops. Scissors. Scissor bishops cutting through the position. This one's coming back here. So beautiful geometry here. Um, I don't know, queen f5. This is pathetic. You know, it's a pathetic position to, to, to have. You can't hold this. It's over. Not to be too harsh, but... It's bad. I'm just trying to be honest. It's very, very bad for white. Um, D4? Wait, what's going on here? I mean, you can just take the rook. If you want, you can just eat the rook here and you're winning. You're up too many pieces. You're up uh, queen, rook, winning game. Okay, so, but instead taking on D2, I mean, that's that's tempting. You make the king centralized, but, but you can see that the king actually has an escape path back to B2 and he's... It's not ideal. Again, we're going to have another chance to strike it in there. But when you have the chance, when you see a target, you must exploit it, right? Because you may not get another chance. In this game, you had like five chances to get a better, you know, winning positions. And we already have a winning position. Um, but we, you know, to, to either to make like a, a, sort of, a sort of spike in the evaluation uh, and, you know, increasing your position, multiple chances. But overall, you're still keeping it above. But, but, you, but if you miss enough of those chances, of course, it's going to slip away. So, bishop e5 was again strong. That was another strong. So just a sm slight lapse by not taking, because that was the kill. That was just the, the, the finish. I take I take c3. But after uh, this is fine though, because again that uncontested bishop is nasty, and yeah, it's loose. But still, it's the kind of situation where it's like, okay, your position is so good, but how do you finish it up? And that's why I mentioned in the notes to this game where a lot of this game is kind of a counterintuitive lesson. You know, it's, it's a it's a twofold lesson. The first part is you got to strike. you got to fight for the initiative. And when you have the advantage, attack, attack, attack. Don't just, when you have the advantage, don't just be passive. Sometimes attacking will actually help you to realize that advantage to convert it. Now, there are other times where you just can't do anything else. You sort of have to sit on the position and just improve it. So it's like, this is the kind of position where you just have to keep, keep on turning up the pressure on your opponent until those you know, until the pipes float, right? Until you find that weak spot in the pipe and the whole thing blows up in your opponent's position. So, uh, bishop f6, I think that's fine. You, again, you could bring out the bishop that seems attractive on a6, but this is okay. Um, but see, they're they're slipping away a little bit. Still says minus five. Black is a, the equivalent of a rook up, it says. Uh, queen d6, maybe slightly more precise than e7 because you hit the, you hit push, put pressure here as well as here. But you got to attack this. This is a soft, a soft spot. Um, well, you do attack it. King comes up. Now he's in a pin. Uh, he's under the rook, x-ray of the rook. Pawn's pin. A5. Now you can also go, yeah, bishop f5 is natural, sure. Oh, well, it looks like you're hanging your bishop. But it's interesting, actually, because you get rid of this knight, which is guarding this knight. So, for instance, if we go here, queen takes, and we just take here, and now we've invaded here. We have so much pressure on this position. You know, let's see. I'm here, put pressure here, wing over or something. There's just so much pressure. And again, that uncontested bishop, and now the knight's even softer, even weaker. Actually, we could do that. Pretty bad. Um, maybe in some lines you push and unleash this too. Um, but that's not what happened. So after a5 was played, again, now see the, the advantage is diminishing a little bit, but we're still sitting on. A very attractive position. Okay, it's a pawn down, but with massive compensation in the form of greater central control. The, the bishop pair is very strong. Flaring down, you know, you can activate your bishops pretty easily. And both of them are uncontested. The knights can't. The knights can't even try and block them really. And you, plus, the cent these central pawns can eventually push down, which will tear open lines more to get to the king. All these things you could do to break open the king's position. So yeah, the, the king is. Sort of superficially tucked away, but given all the pressure aiming toward him, this geometry, the geometry of your position, he, of course, black is way better and almost winning. After king a2, e6. Pretty cool folk music, huh? Pretty good. Uh, so g6, uh, a little bit quiet. Oh, maybe the intent was to go bishop f5 now. 
but you could have done on a previous move to taxi too. Um, and you have a little more air for your king. That's not bad. Uh, and then they go g4, and finally the bishop comes to a6. So uh, definitely Andreas has made a few very strong moves. Again, there's some moves, he, a few knockouts he missed, but um, but consistently, like most of the time, he's making very strong moves. So we have one bishop aiming here, and especially if I don't know what what your rating is, but on uh, chess thing goes in the 1200s. I don't know what your official rating is, but if you're in the 1200s, you're doing you know, much stronger than 1200 level play. Now we need to execute. That's the hard part, right? It's, 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 like Lasker said, the hardest thing to win is a one game. Now this is sort of like this is a game that's I guess you can say it's it's a vastly superior game for Black, but it's it needs to be won. It needs to the advantage needs to be increased a bit more, and then we can turn it, or at least you need to convert this. But there should be some tactical chances that present themselves since tactics flow from the superior position, and we clearly have a superior position. Rook H E one. Centralizing, natural enough. And then, okay, this is the move. Yeah, this is the critical move, which I'm sure Andreas was very, um, like, why did I do that afterwards? Um, but look, this is an asset, right? This is a very important asset that you have. Um, and this is just a defensive piece. Well, sure, you can get rid of a defender, but okay, we have another one to come and take its place. So taking C3 is, and you can just see, look at that wild fluctuation in the valuation. The valuation goes from whatever minus three, Black's favor to plus two almost in White's favor. Huge uh, spread between there. Um, and okay, the computer likes bishop g7. I'm not sure that there's other things you could have done too. Just preserve your bishop, right? Preserve your bishop. It's like, okay, to go to investing advice, right? It's like preserve your principal investment, right? You don't want to, uh, this is your, this is an investment you, you put some time in and uh, you don't want to give that thing up. Right. I think there's a lot of connections there between like value investing and chess. Um, it's really interesting um, in that, that long-term view. So yeah, you got to keep that bishop. And what can we do? Again, it's like it's not there's not an immediate kill, which is why the computer says I don't know bishop g7. It's just an improving move. It's a it, it's it's sort of like you can imagine uh, someone like like someone like Harpov is great at that, just making these these little tweaks to his position, improving his king. They say Kar I think Harpov is. Uh, uh, the most active king mover of all players. And he moves his king more than any other player. So these little tweaks you can make. You know, he'll play king h1, king g2, king g7, or something like that. And then he'll, you know, move your rooks to better spaces, things like that. Um, but here, I don't know. Maybe I would play for... Well, I would like to get c5 in, but you get, you're going to drop this. Um, you can play for this eventually. Again, it's it's a hard position, which is maybe you are in time pressure, and I can imagine some frustration. You're just like, okay, I'm just going to take it. I don't know what to do. But again, sit on the position. Uh, here's the, here's how I would try to sort of theorize it to, to make it uh, digestible, and so if you use it, you know, apply it across uh, different games. I would say whenever you have the chance, put maximum pressure on your position as. Actually, uh, maybe you're uh, German, uh, but there's some, I know Germans and French and stuff, different people in uh, different different roots in uh, Switzerland. Um, but I, I was working with the IM, Dimo Werner from Germany. This was in Hungary, in Budapest. And he said, maximize your pieces. Always maximize your pieces. That's something that he, he said that and also finding a good setup. Very simple things, but those simple things will really help a lot if you can apply them consistently. Always come up with a good setup. It's about not just mindlessly bringing out pieces, but having a very concrete idea in mind of what your setup what your setup um, should be and how to maximize your pieces so first things first maximize your pieces place maximum pressure on your opponent in the process if you can't do that at the moment if you've already see we're already sort of maximized in a way i mean look at the diagonals um, we can't move them any further the queen can't well she can go here but that might be a move actually queen c5 um, but if you can't do too much else maybe you can i don't know maybe you can double ropes and increase the pressure on the b file but you just, if you can't maximize, be patient, slowly improve your position as much as possible until the next moment comes where, where you can maximize again or you can strike again. So hopefully that's sort of a useful rule of thumb that I, yeah, I mean, you always, you have to theorize, you know, you have to create your own theories, you can borrow from other theories, but you have to, you know, it's like a scientific method when you're playing chess, come up with methods that work for you across that. It's sort of like, that's how I view it. It's like a science of chess. You, you, you're conducting a bunch of experiments until you come up with, you know, the method that works for you. And, and it's always, you know, you're going to have to try different experiments and it may, one, your one method may not always work. 
but you have to be flexible or be able to figure out which theory matters more than the other theory in a given situation, which one should take precedence. So after knight takes c3, then we have rook e6. Now, but yeah, it's, white is basically winning now. So it goes from black is winning, but how, to white is winning, but how, right? But, but okay, white's up. No, it's not over yet. I would say I would say black is winning a lot more than now than white is winning here. But the problem is that you can't really avoid the trade of pieces. And as white trades off pieces, he gets closer to a favorable end game. So after rook e6, rook takes, queen takes. Now you're going to see eventually this rook can challenge it again. And uh, where well, the queen comes in, works on the diagonals, it's just not pleasant at all. You get h4, h5 coming. Eventually, maybe the rook can. I'm not sure how, but maybe the queen could go here and support the rook coming to here, get the e-file. Um, but again, it's like, well, that that really strong bishop is gone and white's just up a pawn now, and the king is safe enough here. Just fine, actually. Now you can't really get to the king anymore. After rook e8, queen d4. But th that doesn't matter about it. whatever the computer says now. I mean, queen d4, queen a4, that's not a huge difference. Uh, except for that you'd be attacking a weakness here. That is important. Time to, actually, you would win the pawn, <laughs> right? You would win the pawn. So it, it does matter, but queen d4 is fine. Um, queen retreats. So now you're prepared to defend this pawn if need be. Queen c5. Okay, well, that achieved the same idea. Hitting this, hitting this, pressure. Now white is beginning to step up the pressure. Now this knight is obviously passive, but the, for the time being, the bishop's stronger than the knight. We have, we've won the battle of the minor pieces for now. Can't go here, you can't really go, you can't go anywhere. You can try and go here to here, that's about it. The queen is doing that. Maybe this would have been more annoying to do that or that, probably here. But even if you're here, you can't do much. So it's, it, white, again, white's nominally better, theoretically, but to prove it's not easy at all. So I think maybe black can still hold this, or at least do a you know, really good job of, of fighting. Queen c7, so now you're, you're, you're holding out of this pawn for sure. Ah, but then you're losing the d-pawn, right? Because now, so you, you, you deal, that's the problem. Once you start to develop some advantages and they start adding up, it sort of has this exponential, this cascading effect. And then they all just, you know, overwhelm the opponent. So you try and deal with this one, then then, then you leave your queen hanging here. X-ray, now the knight takes on d5, you can't take back. So now black is down two pawns. And now it's just losing. Yeah, it's just losing. It's just a matter of, how white can, can execute here. Um, but it's easier than it was for sure. Now the computer says white's up on with the equivalent of the rook. Again, those evaluations, don't don't take them too seriously. Um, and then, okay, three pawns up. Yeah, we can almost not look at the rest. Um, let's just glance at it real quick. But no need to develop, to delve too deep in it and beat a, beat a dead horse. Um, but rookie one, actually that was a blunder. So maybe there's a chance to do something. I don't know, rook d4 was better. Maybe there was just a clear win there, but... Well, it, the interesting thing is that it sort of is restricted in its play now. But then bishop f3 allows the trade... Oh, yeah, we don't want that. We don't want that because pawn structure is very important, right? Pawn's the soul of chess. This is holding you together. This is holding white together. So both kings are actually sort of stabilized. Well, at the moment, white's king is more stabilized. It turned out that this was actually a really safe haven for the king, more so than black's. But now after this... Black's position is really compromised now because we split pawns. This one's gone. So you only have one protector, really. And the queen knight duo is really strong since the queen does what the knight can't do and vice versa. So they complement each other really well. Um, not to say that the queen and bishop can't work together, but but generally it's favorable to have a queen and knight. And then as you see, that guy is just coming in here. And we have all these open lines that are under attack. And the knights aiming all over the place. It's 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 a loss. Yeah, it's a lost position now. So um, there wasn't too much you could do. And then interestingly, we get into the queen and pawn endgame. But yeah, it's there's no perpetual check here again with the protected king. And then what he does is uh, well then I uh, take one. But then what happens? You can just slowly sort of march. Up. I would what I would do if I were white here is I would probably just move my queen to guard this pawn, and then I would just march like one pawn. That's not going to affect. That's not going to allow white to get any checks. As long as you can stabilize these pawns here and you can support this pawn to march down, then you could easily win. So just in these situations, you just need to sort of have like a winning plan in mind, a winning method, and then just just stick to it. And of course, keep an eye out for what your pawn's trying to do. But 
for, but in this, this is an example of just stopping their main idea, which is of course to go check, 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 to perpetual check you, stopping that idea, and then you really don't have to worry about too much because the more your pawn marches, it's going to become worth the knight, worth the brook, and then queen, the more it marches on board, becoming more threatening, and then it'll speak for itself, and your opponent will be tied down to it, and then you can push another pawn, and you can force that pawn through, and you win. So, check. And then a4, of course. And this was a mistake because then, of course, queen here, and then you convert into a winning king upon endgame. But it was it was either going to be a winning queen upon ending after a few maneuvers, or this with an immediate win, you can resign because you can't you can't stop all the pawns at once. So as you did, you just pushes the pawn. You can't. Well, it's out. So the rule of thumb here, if you if you aren't familiar with the with the king upon endgame principle, is that okay if it's your move. Um, if you can step inside the box of the pawn, you can stop it. So we make a diagonal to create the box. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, just make, so take the pawn and just go diagonally across. And if you can't, if you can't go inside this box on your move, you can't get there. So since if and it's white's move, by the way. But if it's even if it is black's move, you can't get there in time. And then he's gonna go here. You get to here. He gets to here. You get here. He gets here. You get. Oh wait a second. No, I, no, I messed it up. It would be. Here, 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 and then, yeah, and then here, and you can't get to here in time. Um, but it's white's move, so it's over. And then once he gets to here, he gets queen, he resigns. So, uh, wow, there were a lot of ideas there. Um, so I think one of the main things is, again, at the beginning, fighting for the initiative, being contrarian, um, you know, being, um, again, it's not about the style. You can say I'm an aggressive player, I'm a solid player. Sure, you can have that preference, you can opt for it. But when you have the chance to attack, you you kind of have to go for it if you want an advantage. Because otherwise you might miss that chance. And then you just, maybe you'll get a draw if you're lucky, right? We don't want that. We want to be ambitious as possible and, and putting as much pressure as possible. So something like this. Now, of course, no, this is a stylistic choice, the way you want to allow the G takes. Um, but this, it's, it's theoretic, um, or practically speaking, this is a riskier choice, but you can just see that in a situation like this, you would have a really nice position for black. And the small price to pay would be that your your pawns are doubled and your king's in the center, but in re it's only a weakness if they can attack it. So practically speaking, when you actually look at this position, um, or in reality, it's not it's not so easy for white to make use of any drawbacks in black's position. And they're really just assets, they're not deficits. So, after d3. Now, okay, we have the bishop pair. So again, we could have again gone gone for that earlier e5, but kind of okay, that's fine. If you, okay, here's also how it works with style, I think, is, you know, you may have two or three reasonable lines you can choose from. Maybe one is the most perfect line, but you can't, you can't fathom every aspect of what might happen, or maybe it looks too risky. So you just say, you know what, I don't have all the time in the world to analyze all the complications. I'm gonna go with the second, maybe the second best choice, or maybe the slight, slightly safer choice. So you might be a player who's a little more conservative and chooses to do that. That's fine. You can do that. So, but then there might come another moment when you can play for E5 or something. And again, you might just like, I want a castle. That's also fine. Uh, but, but, but actually the version of not playing H6, and remember, if you didn't play H6 and allowed Bishop G5, that was a little more aggressive going bishop d6 right away um but there was a justification which was that the knight can go here so that was actually based in just objective reality that you that this just sim simply doesn't do much again they could double your pawn but they would have to go into an end game which is um which wouldn't be favorable like for instance if after you castle if they want to take right away that end game would definitely be just fine for black probably a little bit better um with the bishop pair you got, oh, you want to take on c6 too? Okay, now again, we have two bishops. We have a center rolling, so I think we can do well in that position. Um, okay, so again, he, maybe his, again, maybe you're, you're a more solid player. I don't know, but consider that. Keep in mind, it's very, I think my style, I would say, is flexible. Well, I do like to fight for the initiative, but at the same time, I like to play a nice end game if I can or restrict my opponent. You know, so it depends on the situation. To play positionally, for instance, but but uh, but again, you can't just be a positional player. You got to be able to strike too. Uh, clearly, Andreas can strike. He's like he knows his tactics. Um, so you and he wait. Well, I think he was kind of waiting for that moment. He said, "Let me castle. You do something silly. I'm going to punish that and play e5. Good. Andreas is much better now. 
And then and that was a bit too passive. Yet. Maybe queen a6 or maybe ignore it even as possible. But there's not really, you have to ask yourself when you're in the line of fire, well, be cold blooded about it. Say, is that really a threat on my queen? Maybe I could just let it just sit there. It looks scary, but I'm just going to go with it. Like cold blooded moves, like just leaving your king out there, but knowing that objectively it works based on your hard analysis. Uh, knight there, rook b8, b3, rook e8. Okay, so instead of going, so again, this d4 idea was very interesting, but it seemed like, okay, it locks things up, even though it really it didn't end up locking it up because you're playing for e4 or f5 in those lines of being trade. But this is fine because you're playing for e4. Well, there's this. Fortunately, this tactic doesn't work for, for white. He's not coordinated enough. Bam. This was really nice. And again, we just have to seize that moment and think, okay, hold on. Okay, let, for example, let's say you have 20 minutes on the clock here. Random number. Let's say you have 20, 15 minutes. So you have some time to think. I wouldn't make an immediate move. I would probably take five moves here. Oh, sorry, five minutes here or more to say, look, I feel like I have my opponent on the hook. I might be, I might be or I might be able to you know, get him on the hook here. Um, so maybe I should... You know, you got to look at every aspect. Maybe I should take on c3. Even though it looks tempting to take on d2 and keep the king in the center, that's sort of like, ah, generally speaking, it's nice. But we want to be as concrete as possible here. Make that concrete move that's going to lead to really a big problem. Now, the beautiful thing is that when you take on d4, sorry, when you take on c3, um, the, the knight can't take, the queen can't take, because bishop e5. So the bishop has to take, which stops any idea of going bishop e3 to block. So when the bishop takes... There's no way to block that e-file, so he's just busted. It's pretty cool. Um, so again, being being decisive, being active, um, being very concrete in your evaluation, and taking that time when you need to. On this, I would say take your time on a critical position, and this is clearly a critical position. Budget your time accordingly. When it's a sim when it's a more straightforward position and you don't feel like it's critical, okay, move a little more quickly. Okay, and then Bishop Knight, you didn't have to go back, but that's fine. And again, it's a little, maybe a little too modest, maybe a little too modest in the execution. Um, okay, that's not a big deal, maybe Queen 7, but uh, A5. Now here's where Bishop F5, that's a hard move to see though, so you're just hanging your Bishop, that's that's possible. And then again, a little, maybe a little too quiet. Now again, you can just bring out your Bishop immediately to A6. But it's kind of like, it's kind of like well, now that you missed that uh, earlier kill on C3, it did slow down a bit. But again, now the really the key thing was taking on C3. So remember, D pick. So first strike, strike, strike as much as you can. And then if that doesn't work, be willing to stop. So let's see if there's anyone who happened to comment on it. Um, any let me know if you guys there's a couple people watching now. Let me know if you guys have any questions about it. Uh, hopefully that was helpful in terms of some general principles you can you can pull from this game. Um, there's our there's our Swiss folk music. Um, is our lead chess site and uh yeah i think that pretty much covers it so this was a tactical game uh i guess a, a, some positional ideas but it was a very dynamic game but it's really just about it's about the execution this game is a lot about about conversion you know patience when you need to strike and so forth and it's it, it's it takes time to develop that you know you've only been playing for a few years so it takes time to develop a really good intuition and no one ever, you know, yeah, you, I guess I guess maybe the world champions sort of master, but no one ever gets it right 100% of the time. That intuition, when should I strike? When should I wait? When should I sit on the position? But again, I think that rule of thumb might be helpful where, where, from this game where we can maybe uh, conclude. So always try to put maximum pressure on your opponent. And if there's nothing else you could do at the moment, then just make those tweaks to your position. But be patient. Sit on the position. And don't give up any of your hard-earned assets like that bishop, right? That would be like, yeah, that or that that would kind of be like, let's say, for example, if you're a value investor, if you if you bought something, or maybe you bought it at the top of the market, you let it go down, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna sell it off. No, then you're gonna then you're gonna suffer big loss, right? So sometimes you just gotta hold on to that asset, ride it out, and then in the long run, it should benefit. So um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions, and feel free to submit your games. So I can do some more analysis and uh, let me know if you have a music preference, trying to incorporate the music. Hopefully it worked out with the volume levels and uh, maybe I'll do some chess 960 games. And, um, I got, after looking at all this crazy line, I'm kind of in the mood to play some chess 960 games. All right. Have a good evening and again, happy new year, everyone.